Shall I start now? Yes. Here is a 27 year old male mm. from Bangi Pali, Chikbalapura. Education, IPI, and occupation is bank employee. Mm. The informant uh, is self. Just a minute. Uh, I'll just go live. It's not live on YouTube yet. Uh, just a minute. Okay, sir. Good evening, everyone. The White Army is privileged to have with us Professor Asar Chandra, ma'am, retired professor from Nimans, Bangalore, as a mentor for our case presentation today. Welcome to you, madam. Thank you. Inchara, third year uh, MD medicine student from Hassan Institute of Medical Sciences, has volunteered to present a case. Uh, welcome to Inchara and welcome to all the participants. With madam's permission, we shall begin the session. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, I uh, Coming to the details of the patient, uh, here is a uh, male patient, 27-year-old, hailing from Bagepalli, Chikbalapra. Education to ITI and occupation is a bank employee. Informant is self and reliable and right-handedness. Admitted on 12th of October and examined on the same day. Coming to the chief complaints of the patient, he is complaining of a right upper limb weakness since 10 years and left upper limb weakness since five years, right lower limb weakness since three years, and left lower limb weakness since three years, and complaints of neck weakness since one year. Coming to the history of presenting illness, patient was apparently normal 10 years back uh, when he was studying 10th standard. Then started noticing weakness in the right upper limb in the form of a uh, um, right upper limb, which is uh, insidious in onset, gradually progressing, and it is persistent difficulty in lifting the objects above head, difficulty in reaching higher objects above the shelf, difficulty in combing hair, difficulty in taking bath in the form of difficulty in uh, keeping the mug of water above the shoulder. At this point of time, there was no difficulty in mixing the food, writing and holding pen in the school, no difficulty in buttoning or unbuttoning shirt, and no difficulty in opening the cap of the bottle. And there was also no history of tingling, numbness, paresthesia, and a burning sensation in the right upper limb. And there was no history of stiffness in the right upper limb, no history of twitching or fasciculations, no history of fatigue, episodic weakness, or diagonal variation, no history of cramps or contractures, or difficulty in relaxation, or uh, um, discol brownish discoloration of the urine. There was also no history of variation. I think it is not audible now. Hello? It is yeah. not audible. Can you, uh, can you repeat uh, this one? Incha? Are you there? Yes, now, yes, sir. It's audible. Sir, it's yeah, now audible. it's audible. Yes. yes. yes sir. Next. Uh, coming to the history of presenting illness, hmm. the patient was apparently normal 10 years back. When he was studying 10th standard, then started noticing weakness in the right upper limb, which was insidious in onset, gradually progressing, and persistent weakness. The patient was complaining he was not able to lift the objects above head, and there was difficulty in reaching the higher objects above shelf. There was also difficulty in combing hair, difficulty in taking bath in the form of difficulty in keeping the mug of water above the shoulder level. But at this point of time, there was no difficulty in mixing the food, writing and holding pen in the school, no difficulty in buttoning and unbuttoning the shirt. There was no difficulty in opening the cap of the bottle. Hello. Okay. Yes, talking. Yes, now audible. 
However, at this point of time, there was no history of tingling or burning sensation in the right upper limb. There was no history of sickness in the right upper limb. No history of twitching or fasciculations. No history of fatigue. Or if you are a little uh, louder, something is wrong. Not very clear. There was no some shakiness and uh, clarity is not there. Uh, Ma'am, now? Uh, now better. There was no history of cramps or contractures or difficulty in relaxation. Uh, there was no history of brownish discoloration of urine. There was no history of variation to cold temperature or exercise. Uh, eventually, mainly in the arm region. And the disease was progressive and patient uh, noticed increasing weakness gradually. Okay. After five years, uh, the patient noticed uh, weakness in the left upper limb. Uh, insidious in onset, gradually progressive. It was in the same pattern as, would, as it was in the right upper limb. Uh, however, at this point also, there is no history suggestive of involvement of the sensory system and there was no fasciculation. Sir. Two years later, the patient noticed difficulty in walking due to tripping of his right foot. So he used to lift his uh, limb higher up without any difficulty in keeping the step. He also noticed his foot was hanging freely when he lifts it up to keep a step. Also, there was uh, difficulty in gripping the slippers. A patient can put his foot into the slipper, but difficulty in sliding the foot into slippers and holding them. There was a frequent slippage of uh, slippers. With the patient being aware of it. However, at this point of time, there was no history uh, of difficulty in climbing the stairs, getting up from the squatting position. Patient finds it difficult to get up from the sitting position with cross legs crossed and uses his left upper limb to support it. Um, but there was no history suggestive of sensory or cranial nerve involvement at this point. No history of fasciculations or stiffness. Patient can lift his head but finds a difficulty to lift his trunk and then turns to one side. No difficulty in rolling over the bed. Uh, since one year, patient noticed weakness in uh, the neck uh, as he cannot maintain the steadiness of the neck while walking. Patient attendants also noticed the patient will not close his eyes completely while sleeping. And patient features in the form of a flattened smile and a reduced facial expressions. There is no history of neck pain or back. History suggestive of sensory or cerebellar or autonomic involvement. There is no history of ptosis or double vision or a decreased vision. There is no history of bowel or bladder involvement. Dysarthria or nasal regurgitation. There is no history of dyspnea, orthopnea, palpitation or chest pain. There is no history of hard of hearing. No history of weight loss or loss of appetite and toxin exposure. Shall I proceed, ma'am? Oh, yes, we can. Uh, maybe we can discuss the symptoms one by one. Yes, ma'am. Uh, according to you, his problem started in you know, lifting the hand above the head in an asymmetrical yes. fashion. Yes, ma'am. First, it started in the right upper limb. Hmm. So significantly asymmetrical. That is one point. And it was proximal. Proximal. Yes, ma'am. So, um, so let us analyze the localization for that and what are the proximal movements that can happen in the upper limb, if you take it. Would you like to tell? I am sure you know it is abduction, abduction, adduction, adduction anterior flexion, flexion, extension, posterior flexion, protraction, 
and retraction internal rotation internal yes, rotation external rotation external rotation is yes, ma'am yes, so ma we would do a small exercise of course you have told clearly that his problem is in lifting the hand above the uh, head or activity of the whole upper head uh, issues so what is that yes, movement it is overhead abduction yes so that yes, is how it is affected first what are all the muscles involved in abduction um abduction initiation of the abduction it is supraspinatus sir very good then, then up to 90 degrees deltoid huh? very good then beyond that trapezius so audible huh? is it audible audibility is there huh? yes ma'am so it is as you clearly told it is supraspinatus deltoid and trapezius so are you able yes, to find out which part is affected in this patient so we last patient it's overhead abduction mainly trapezius so it is probably trapezius and uh, yes, if it is just overhead only it may be trapezius so other yes, features of trapezius involvement we will try to find out whether it is only trapezius or is it a cranial neuropathy because it is so much asymmetrical so cranial neuropathy we don't know so we will ask other features of trapezius involvement is there or not so ap apart from overhead abduction what are all the other pointers of trapezius weakness from the history and the examination together we will uh, say so we can confirm later hmm? yes ma'am uh, trapezius will help in the maintaining the posture of the scapula yes so what you will find so you will be thinking of scapula so on the coronal moment prominence of the scapula you can ask then you yes, can ask squaring of the shoulder because trapezius contributes to the rounded contour of the shoulder so if the trapezius yes, is paralyzed the shoulder contour becomes squared and because the trapezius folds up the scapula the shoulder will droop so squaring of the shoulder drooping of the shoulder winging of the scapula and the medial angle of the scapula raising a skin fold and forms a scapular hump yes ma'am so is there a hump there and is that wrong hanging down and does his winging become prominent during abduction so these are the points you last patient may be able to tell he is an educated person iti graduate you told so sometimes yes, they may be observant and they may be able to tell so that will confirm that it is probably the trapezius which is getting involved then at this point we will use the exercise what all the adductors uh, if you are asked adduction pectoral yes. pectoralis major and latissimus dorsi very good so you should tell that passive adduction is and uh, does not needing any muscle when you do an adduction against gravity or when you do an adduction against resistance only muscles are involved otherwise it is just passive you don't abduct the arm becomes adducted and that doesn't need any muscle so if you are anti gravity adduction or re against resistance adduction involves pectoralis major and latissimus dorsi dorsi may be assisted by the teres major to some extent okay then yes. what about the uh, anterior flexion anterior flexion by the pectoralis major anterior flexion is by anterior fibers of deltoid and deltoid. posterior flexion is by the posterior, posterior fibers, fibers of deltoid. deltoid and protraction is by you want to tell Pro protraction is by pectoralis minor so pectoralis okay. major is for adduction and pectoralis minor is for protraction protraction is assisted by serratus anterior so when you are protracting your uh, shoulder the shoulder should not come out so that fixation or the synergistic effect is by the serratus anterior so protraction is by pectoralis minor and synergistic by the serratus anterior which is a posterior muscle then what about retraction rhomboides yes rhomboids is a very small muscle so main retraction is by the lower fibers of the trapezius and it is assisted by the rhomboids so lower fibers of the trapezius with the rhomboids is in retraction then what about uh, internal rotation internal rotation is by the subscapularis and it is assisted by 
pectoralis major. So internal rotation is by pector, subscapularis. And external yes. rotation is by infraspinatus. Yes. 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 Primary external rotator is infraspinator, spinatus, and it is assisted by teres minor. Teres minor. Yes. Uh, then internal rotation is mainly by the subscapularis, and it gets some degree of assistance from pectoralis major. So these are the uh, various muscles that are involved in the actions of the shoulder. What about yes. the elbow? Want to tell elbow flexion? Elbow yes. is very easy. Elbow flexion mainly by uh, biceps and brachioradialis, sir, and yes. extension by triceps. Very good. So how will you check uh, triceps? How will you examine triceps? Um, extension of the flexed elbow against resistance. Uh, that you should not check because you check in your own hand. You keep your hand flexed and check. Even though we do it routinely because it is easy for us to do. Now all of us will have only four minus power. If you keep your elbow flexed and tell the patient to extend it, now our, if it is already in the maximum stretched portion uh, position, triceps goes into maximum stretch. So the power will be less efficient. So you should not check the tri elbow extension by keeping the elbow flex. You should always keep the position. Some muscles are tested best in the isotonic and some muscles are checked mm -hmm. best in the isometric. So this is one where you should check in the isometric. So you will keep the uh, arm extended like this. Yes, and then try to break it. That is how you will check the uh, triceps. And biceps you can check by telling the patient to keep the arm flexed and then try to oppose that. Then how will you check break your radialis? You told break your radialis is assisting in elbow. Ask the patient to flex. Ask the patient to flex the uh, elbow and mm -hmm. pronation uh, in the pronated position. Then as semi prone and ask the patient to uh, try to touch so his semi up to his nose. It's semi prone flexion. Semi prone yes, flexion. You will do break your radialis. Then what about the pronator and the supinator? Supinator muscle is there. It is a deep muscle. It will not be visible for you to palpate. So you keep the tell the patient to mildly flex and supinate it. I'm sorry, mildly flex and supinate it. Supinate. And then try to pronate it from distal. So mildly flex at the elbow and the uh, arm is kept in supinated position and you try to pronate and tell the patient to prevent that. Similarly, Pronation is checked by keeping the arm slightly elbow flex and pronated position and try to supinate. And that is pronator teres. And you have got another pronator quadratus. Pronator quadratus is checked by keeping the arm in full extension and then you do the pronation. Pronator quadratus is checked by keeping the arm in full uh, extension. Whereas it's pronator teres is in the elbow in partial flexion. And then uh, keep the arm in the pronated position and try to supinate and tell the patient to resist it. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hello. So that is uh, pronators. We have flexor, extensor, pronator, supinator. Then we will come to the wrist. So in the wrist, you have got flexion, yes, extension. And uh, fl yes, uh, flexor muscles are flexor carpi ulnaris. Flexor carpi radialis. So flexor carpi ulnaris is ulnar flexion. Radialis is radial flexion. Complete flexion is all the three muscles together. And the elbow extension is again extensor carpi radialis. And then extensor carpi ulnaris. It can be either radial or ulnar extension or together. You can check that. Then you have got palmaris longus. Palmaris longus is checked by telling the patient to keep the arm in a Cupping position. It's a cupping muscle. So tell the patient to make a cup with a palm and palpate the palmaris longus. Palmaris bruvis is a muscle in the medial part of the uh, ulnar region. And look for the pillow, palpate the pillow shaped muscle. There is a palmaris bruvis. Then you have got a uh, wrist extension. And yes, you have got finger extension. You have got wrist finger flexion, proximal distal and wrist flexion. So wrist flexion. extension and flexion is mainly by the muscles that acts on the radial and ulnar region together. 
you can check it together like that and if you want to check the uh, finger uh, uh, wrist flexion also it is the the same muscles together you can check like this and prevent it yes. then you have got the finger flexion uh, finger flexion finger flexion you have got distal and proximal flexor digitorum profundus is distal distal and flexor digitorum superficialis is proximal so proximal distal. finger flexion is by the superficialis and distal is by the uh, profundus then you have got extensor indices extensor um, digiti minimi and the extensor digitorum muscles then you have got the lumbricals lumbricals are working on the so you do, tell the patient to keep like this that is all like the lumbricals are checked together they are acting on the extension of the interphalangeal joints that is lumbricals then you have got interosseous that is adduction and abduction so what are, what are interosseous adduction yes which is adduction palmar interosseous adduction And and so about the 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 small small muscles, muscles some more points are there. All the small muscles in the hand are there. All hand supplied with ulnar nerve, other than the medial to lumbricals. Second, you have got the, um, palmar interosse and you have got dorsal interosse. Palmar interosse is for adduction, dorsal interosse is for abduction, and you have got four dorsal interosse. And you got three palmar interosse, three palmar interosse. There are some unique features. You are MD student, so little more. Uh, I am uh, talking. Last class was MBBS student, so we are MD student. So that is I am telling all this. Is palmar interosse are three, and the unique feature is there is no palmar interosse to the middle finger. In the Easter years, when we are all doing MD, MD, uh, these examiners used to ask. Tell the palmar interosse which is in, in, inserted into the middle finger. So you will tell some interosse and everybody will know. So there is no interosse in the palmar region which is inserted into the middle finger, and there is no dorsal interosse to the thumb and the little finger. So those are features about the small muscles. All lumbricals by ulnar other than the lateral two. The interosse palmar is three, dorsal is four. Middle finger has no palmar interosse. Thumb and the little finger has no dorsal interosse. So these are unique features. And then you should know the actions: adduction, abduction, sorry, flexion, extension, extension. adduction, abduction. abduction. So adduction and abduction is taking place perpendicular to the palm, and flexion and extension is taking place along the plane of the palm. So adduction and abduction is perpendicular. Flexion and extension is along the plane of the palm. Then all the longest muscle to the big toe act distally. You have got extensor pollicis longus, and uh, abduct. Uh, you have got flexor pollicis longus, and you have got abductor pollicis longus. So among all these, the abductor pollicis groove is is tested by testing. Distal pressure than the abductor pollicis longus. All other longus muscle act on the distal joints. So thumb, some people ask, some ten points. So flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, and you have got the uh, long long uh, muscles to the distal except the abductor pollicis longus, which is more proximal power, uh, proximal resistance than the uh, abductor pollicis groove. So abductor pollicis groove is. is Uh, tested by pressure more distally than the abductor pollicis longus. All other muscles you offer assistance distally. So these are the uh, muscles with reference to the hand. So now we are having a patient who is having probably uh, trapezius involvement uh, to start with. And after so other muscles, we are not getting any clue at that point of time. And several years later. This person, is, so only the overhead abduction is involved, and probably we think it is human. Why are we thinking it is human? Sorry, we are thinking it is elemen. Elemen, because there right. is no, there is no stiffness, ma'am. No stiffness. Very good. So there is no sensory involvement. No, that need not be there. You see, yeah, elemen is uh, human is movement paralysis. So all human disorders involve the fine movements first. 
So it will be human generally produ produces distal weakness with some exceptions, like for example, Hubner artery, where the proximal becomes involved, even though it is human. That is because Hubner artery is not supplying the distal part at all. Otherwise, any human weakness, it will be um, uh, distal more than proximal because fine movements will be more affected than coarse movement. And second, as you tell, stiffness. And when you examine, you might find exaggerated reflexes. You do not find any wasting or fasciculation. And uh, when you examine the whole person, superficial reflexes are depressed, deep reflexes are exaggerated. So because this is proximal, and because the patient has no stiffness, it is probably at the level of LM. So LM muscle, myoneural junction, or, um, or anterior horn Yes, anterior horn So all these are you are keeping at uh, uh, abeyance. You don't know what it is. Uh, but uh, some unique features is uh, five years difference you are telling between the right upper limb and the left upper limb. Left upper limb is ma'am. So it's a very long period of uh, difference. So it seems to be a disease which is asymmetrical, significant asymmetrical. So asymmetry, normally we will think of what all conditions? Asymmetry uh, in inclusion body myositis, uh, vicious capillary humeral dystrophy. No, ground neuron disease is there. In a purely motor syndrome, purely motor syndrome, with gross asymmetry. Motor neuron disease. Correct. That is the first diagnosis. You should not be telling muscle diseases. The muscle diseases are essentially symmetrical diseases. Otherwise, if you have a focal myositis or tumors of the muscle, muscle sarcomas or inflammatory lesions, pyomyositis, those things can be asymmetrical. Otherwise, primary muscle diseases or secondary muscle disease due to metabolic cause or uh, whatever it is, they are symmetrical. Yes, so, and foremost, asymmetry means anterior consul, element level anterior consul disease, most important. Second, sometimes you can have neuromuscular junction disease, that is limb onset myasthenia. They can yes, be asymmetrical. So neuromuscular junction disease are necessarily not symmetrical. Essentially, they are not symmetrical. So it could be neuromuscular junction disease. Then third, motor nerves. So are you dealing with a condition supplying the nerve supply to the trapezius? Which nerve is supplying trapezius? Spinal accessory now. Accessory. So what is the yes, other that is supplied by the accessory nerve? Synocleidomastoid. So uh, there is some uniqueness from supranuclear to nuclear to infranuclear. Even though the nerve is supplying both stenomastoid and trapezius, from the supranuclear connection to the supranuclear connection to the muscle, they are dissociated. So they can be differentially involved. Trapezius can be involved alone or stenomastoid can be involved alone. Supposing you have got a left-sided lesion, left corticulation, you will find that the head and the eye deviated to the opposite side. That is because it's a lateral stenomastoid to the side of hemispheric lesion. So at the level of supranuclear, there is a difference. Supranuclear control over the accessory nerve innervated muscle is ipsilateral stenomastoid and contralateral trapezius. So supposing there is an anti-hemonsal disease and supranuclear involvement of the uh, supranuclear connection to the accessory nerve nucleus is affected, then it will be ipsilateral stenomastoid and contralateral trapezius. So at the level of the supranuclear level, connection to the accessory nerve is dissociated. Yes, ma'am. When you come to the nucleus, at the level of the nucleus, there is a dorsoventral arrangement. Again, they are distinctly different. The uh, trapezius is dorsal and stenomastoid is ventral. So it can be differentially okay. involved. Then when it comes to the terminal branches, they are also different. So they are separated. Yes, so it can be uh, at any level and one part may be affected. So we do not know whether it is at the level of the nerve. It is a purely motor nerve. So it need not affect any sensation. Unlike the mixed nerves, this is not a mixed nerve. 
So you yes, can be at the level of um, um, anterior horn it can be at the level of neuromuscular junction, it can be at the level of the accessory nerve, and uh, that much only we can consider uh, with reference to localization to the trapezius uh, involvement. Then we will see that after 10 years, so muscle disease becomes very lost in the list at that point of time. Yes, ma'am. With five years separation and patient has come to you 10 years ago, when only one trapezius is involved, anybody will diagnose only anterior consult disease. Of course, at the end, you may make different diagnosis now when 10 years story is available to you. But at that time, I don't think you can unless you found other features also evident, but patient was not knowing. That is there. Patient may not be knowing because of the slow evolution until it becomes very disabling. Patient may not realize that. That way it is possible. Otherwise, pure trapezius involvement remaining like that for five years, first diagnosis will not be muscle disease. So next, but one unique thing at this point, being an MD student, examiner can ask you. So yes, something unique you are seeing, it started with the right upper limb, then it went on to the left upper limb, then it came to the right lower limb, and then it came to the left lower limb. Forget human or lemon. What is this pattern called? Ellsberg phenomenon. No, this is called Z pattern. Okay. What is Ellsberg phenomenon? Um, that is a, a, it is a U shape. U shape. So it is a one upper limb, ipsilateral lower limb, opposite lower limb, opposite upper limb. That is Ellsberg. Whereas here it is one upper limb, then opposite upper limb, then ipsilateral lower limb, opposite lower limb. This is called Z pattern. Z pattern, okay. Mm -hmm. So a Z pattern, LMN to start with, is seen in what condition? Foramen magnum lesions. Like lipomas. Then plexiform neurofibromas at the level of foramen magnum. So that is Z pattern. Whereas Ellsberg phenomena is in uh, high cervical cord compression. So yes, if you forget what exactly has happened over a period of time and the facial and other things which happened late in the course of the disease, there is a pattern. This looks like an ESET pattern. So is my patient having a uh, chronic plexiform neurofibromatosis? Young man, they can have plexiform neurofibromatosis. It need not produce that much compression because it is soft and soft and plexiform. So Z pattern is typically yes. described in foramen magnum tumors, lipomas, or plexiform neurofibromatosis. So that also you can keep in your mind. So you may have surprises sometimes. I have yes. seen patients who are diagnosed as um, um, MND, facial scapular humeral dystrophy, uh, but they turned out to be Arnold Chiari malformation with CV junction anomalies. Because of the yes, Arnold Chiari, they have lower cranial nerve. Later, they can have syringobulbia. So I have seen patients like this because they can closely resemble like that. So uh, it can be mistaken. So foramen magnum tumors, which produce a set pattern, where the upper limb is LMN only. Whereas in yes. Ellsberg, everything is UMN. Ellsberg, yes. the ipsilateral upper limb, ipsilateral lower limb, contralateral lower limb, and contralateral upper limb is upper motor neuron. Nothing is lower motor neuron. In Z pattern, the upper limbs are LMN. So this is LMN. So are we having a foramen magnum lesion? We don't. So we will keep it like that. All these yes, are the possibilities. Then the left upper limb, we don't have to discuss much. It is the same way of evolution. So the left upper limb also, proximal movement got affected. Then in the lower limb, you are having a, mm, a distal pattern. So you told distal that muscle. Muscles, he could not hold. That means yes, one, short muscles. So in Rashi, like the hand, I got the Indarashi, he is not able to hold the chapels and walk. That means a short muscle. So it is proximal upper limb and distal lower limb. Yes, so that is one pattern. So one pattern you saw is probably an Z pattern. And second pattern you got proximal upper limb and distal lower limb. Third, grossly asymmetrical. Yes, ma'am. So unique features so far we have seen. And four will be purely motor. Yes, ma'am. Five will be probably element. 
So in the lower limb, you saw, got the inner osseae weaker. After that, what was the lower limb symptom? Chappal holding your um, What else? What is the second problem in the lower limb? Uh, only distal muscle weakness. Only distal. So in the yes, lower limb, both the inner osseae got involved. And last, you told that he lost facial expressions. Yes, ma'am. So what did you feel in the face? Was it unilateral, bilateral? Facial expression means uh, uh, when you use the term facial expression, you should be very careful. No? Yes, ma'am. Is it the expression motor or emotional? Or both? Uh, motor. Motor. So you, instead yes, of telling it as expression, when we use the term expression, generally it is presumed it is emotional expression. Okay. So it, then we will think whether there is a supranuclear involvement, mimic facial palsy, so the emotional yes, palsy. It is better you tell that question is unable to uh, smile or show any motor movement with the facial muscles and express his emotions in the motor way. Yes, ma'am. So that is better way. And uh, because you will uh, think whether it is a mimic facial palsy. So you can say that he was unable to smile. He was unable to uh, blow a balloon or blow a uh, tube or blow air. Uh, yes, ma'am. Unable to whistle. So these symptoms yes. were expressed by experienced by the patient in a symmetrical fashion. So supposing you have got a set pattern, forget about uh, whatever element in the lower limb. You have a, because distal in the lower limb, it can very well be human also. Because human movements are distal. So you have an element in the upper limb which is showing an iset pattern of evolution and you are having yes, a bilateral ma'am. facial palsy. I would, and so much asymmetry. Yes, ma'am. Years, years of asymmetry. My first yes, diagnosis will not be a muscle disease. If you are truthful to your clinical yes. neurology, your first diagnosis yes, will be a foramen magnum lesion. I have seen plexiform neurofibromas being mistaken as FSHD. I have seen yes, large vertebral artery aneurysm. Large vertebral artery aneurysm in the foramen magnum lesion behaving like this. Exactly. I have the picture of the patient also. He was labeled yes, as muscle disease for a long time. And later he was evaluated and found the vertebral artery aneurysm. That is same like a plexiform neurofibromatosis growing over a longer period of time. So this way, these are very much a mistaken conditions. So my first diagnosis, considering the grass asymmetry, is that pattern yes, L in the upper limb and distal lower limb, whether it is L or M, we don't know. Yes, ma'am. My, I would like to consider if I do not know the case fully. You have seen the case, so you may know the case. If I do not know the case. I will diagnose yes, first by diagnosis will be for Amman magnum lesion Amman. with probably brainstem herniation, Arnold Chiari malformation, where it can be just the cerebellar tonsil or the whole brainstem can descend into the for Amman magnum. Very uh, degrees ma ma of. Ma'am, I have a doubt. No? Hmm. In for Amman magnum syndrome, like uh, the patient, uh, uh, does the patient have uh, dysphagia or dysarthria or nasal regurgitation, any bulbar? Yes, when there is a, yes, these are the anomalies, no? Arnold Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, syringobulbia. These are the association with the foramen banger pathology. See, uh, foramen banger pathology it is not have... You will say a bony anomaly and soft tissue anomaly or combination. That is what happened. So, uh, so my, um, uh, what does not happen? What was your question? Tell me. Uh, as the patient is not having a dysphagia and nasal regurgitation or well, he should have. There is nothing that he should have, no. Yes, he no. can have. There is nothing that he should have a bulbar symptom to diagnose a foramen magnum lesion. He can okay. have. He, he, there is nothing that he should have. He should is not necessary. CV junction anomalies can present with uh, drop attacks. They can have a tibra basilar ischemia, lower cranial pal palsy, hydrocephalus, fear ataxia, progressive myelopathy, then Z pattern. All these are various patterns of foramen magnum lesions. Depending on the nature of the lesion, it is a soft plexiform lesion. It will not compress, it will only displace. But it is a so hard, hard tumor, metastasis. 
or uh, then it will compress. Plexiform lesions, they are lipomas, very common in the foramen magnum. They just softly compress them. So they will not produce all the uh, problems. Otherwise, uh, if you tell the diagnosis as your history diagnosis, as a postgraduate, people may not agree. Because as an undergraduate student, you have seen everything together and you don't have much um, uh, thought process why, about why this much five years of asymmetric question and you think at the, at the end of examination. See, at the end of your history, what is tested is what you make a diagnosis after complete examination. How are you analyzing that symptom? So that the one odd case you don't miss. The vertebral artery aneurysm I told is a person who was um, uh, dearly labeled as FSHD for a very long time. Yes, ma'am. Until later he developed a small leak. At that time he was evaluated because FSHD, if you diagnose, there is no recommendation to do genetics, no recommendation to, to do muscle biopsy because the phenotype is diagnostic. So people, okay. uh, it's a recommendation, it's a scientific recommendation. So people did not do anything. He was diagnosed as muscle disease in premier institutions in Kerala. I recently yeah. saw him with a severe neck pain and he had a uh, leak, small leak. Then only we did imaging and large vertebral artery aneurysm was found. Then he was sent to Nemans where he was coiled and uh, he is now much better. So this is very much uh, resembling a uh, use that way. That one case you will pick up only if you ask that question. Why is this much severe asymmetry? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma so those crucial questions are you ask, asking. That is the purpose of history discussion. Otherwise, you have examined the case. Why should we discuss the history? That yes, history discussion is to uh, allow you to have a broader differential diagnosis and not miss the one odd case. So if you okay. say uh, at the end of my examination, I found purely element with bilateral facial and uh, proximal upper limb, distal lower limb, I think it is FSHD. Then you have not picked up the odd feature. I always tell that any case, you have got hard features, soft features, and odd features. So hard features will give you the diagnosis. Soft features never make a diagnosis on soft features. You will be always wrong. And you should not be carried away by soft features. And odd features should awaken you, alert you. When you see the odd features, become alerted and see what is happening. So we should, I think, of different possibilities. So you have a very odd feature if the history that your patient gave you is correct. If the yes, history is correct, it's a very odd feature. Five years uh, asymmetry, still it can happen, but uh, it will not be this much uh, asymmetry. But patient might have missed it being the non-dominant hand. He might not be focused on the dominant right hand. And so he would have missed it. That possibility is there. But this is definitely an odd feature. Several years of half a decade, as per the history yes. of half a decade. So the grass asymmetry, my patients, Hard features are purely element, proximal upper limb, distal lower limb, and facial involvement at the end of examination. So they are hard features. So I would like to consider an element syndrome which involves facial muscles, proximal upper limb girdle, and distal lower limb. Okay. But what is special? This person has got gross asymmetry. One decade of, half a decade of asymmetry. So is it a mimic? I will always give that benefit to my patient. So this yes, odd feature picking up is very important. So your patient definitely has an odd feature. So you will keep it in your mind. Yes, ma'am. What I am trying to tell you. That is why we discuss history. You see, yes, everything in medicine is not one is to one. So we always tell one is to one may sometimes be three, <laughs> four. No? Because uh, each case is different. And that yes, is based on the odd features that you pick up. So learning to pick up the odd features will help you to plan the evaluation. That is yes, the purpose. Ultimately, you will be the right person, but uh, you should learn to pick up the odd features. That is what I am saying. So now he has got a facial policy also. So considering the odd features, I would like to roll out the foramen magnum lesion as the first possibility. Second is the 
here element muscle disease, myonaural junction disease, and tonsil disease. So I'm dealing with an anterior tonsil disease, which are very well known to be asymmetrical and random. It can be purely element, it can be purely human, or it can be element plus human. So anterior tonsil disease are very well known to be grossly asymmetrical. It can be element, human, element plus human, it can be cranial, it can be limb. So all this can be involved. So second diagnosis for me again will not be muscle disease, I'll consider antihonsal disease. So first is a foramen magnum lesion. Considering it is grass, now it is supposing it is two to three months, I would have ignored. Yes. It is five years. I cannot ignore. So second possibility will be a young onset anterior tonsil disease. And third possibility. I have a doubt. Yes. Um, the patient is not having uh, uh, fasciculations. Huh? And uh, here the weakness is more than wasting. Huh? Can we consider anterior onset at this stage also? Yeah, everything is possible now. Uh, fasciculation is not a must also. You see. Okay. So we are only just uh, considering the differential diagnosis. Okay. You know, giving relevance to the odd features. We are considering the different first diagnosis as a primary muscle disease. You will not diagnose with this much asymmetry. Yes, ma'am. You cannot yes, diagnose. You see. Uh, so at this point, would you like to define? So third possibility I will consider probably an FSHD where patient focused his attention on the dominant hand. And everything else was probably very chronic. So well adjusted patient. Until it disabled him, he did not help. We generally tell that people who are having a chronic problem, they are well adjusted with abnormality. They might not have been normal at all. So they are well adjusted with abnormality. They do not know that it is abnormal. So that way, he would not have complained until it became very late and very evident. So that possibility is there. Many yes. patients, the uh, uh, if FSHD family tried, uh, will be totally missed. They will think he is a very cold person. So he's always like that with a stiff face. Otherwise, nothing is wrong with him. Because uh, in the younger and younger generation, it becomes more and more expressive, dominant disease. But you look at the parents, they, they will say, no, nothing is wrong, except that he's a very cold person, always keeps a glum face. That is the, uh, yes. maybe the only sign. So like that, when they are so much adjusted to abnormality, they may not know it is abnormal. Yes, ma'am. So that way you can think of a muscle disease, being it is being purely motor. You can think of a muscle disease. You will consider neuromuscular junction unlikely, even though asymmetry is possible in um, purely motor syndrome, because in yes, the lower limb it is distal. Neuromuscular junction, we are expecting lower limb also proximal because it involves yes, the particular muscles. So, because in the lower limit it involved distal neuromuscular junction is less likely. So, my first diagnosis for Amon Magnum, second anterior consul, third I will consider a muscle disease which can involve the facial muscles also and it can be moderately asymmetrical, not severely asymmetrical but being uh, used to this abnormality for a long time. So, yeah. huh? Patient is uh, not knowing that uh, he had been abnormal and it, it became too late. So these are the three possibilities. So the uh, history diagnosed this much. No? So you go to exam. Go to exam. Open up. Open please. Tell me history. Examine. Uh, pa past history. I am discussing like this. You are the right person. I know your diagnosis is right. But then you should not miss that one case which you will see once in your lifetime. Yes, ma'am. I have seen CV junction with the syringobalbia being labeled as FSHD for a long time. Yes, disease. And the second, in my third, th three decade career, I have seen only two cases. Second one is okay. ventral artery and it is, but it is worth. So you should yes, pick up the heart features. That is all. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, in head to toe examination, GP, uh, the vitals are stable, ma'am. 
nothing is having contributed to the disease sir yes. and in head to toe examination oh. uh, the patient was having heterochromia iridis sir yes. on closure of the heterochromia iridis ma'am okay. and on closing of the eyes there was no uh, burying of the eye lashes no, so you get heterochromia iridis it may be familial it can yes. be associated with albinos otherwise not this case generally uh, not it can run in families one no second it can be partial albinism hmm? third is yes, congenital corners supposing some okay. is coming the corners syndrome and yes, they never knew about that. and when you uh, you are wondering whether i am reading with the uh, what cell carcinoma of the lung infiltrating into the uh, cid on roots uh, he does in no, no? So, if you see heterochromia iridis, you can say no, no. This person tumor yes. is not infiltrating; it is congenital. So, heterochromia okay. iridis is a feature of congenital corner. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And on closing of the eyes, sir, there was no burying of the eyelashes, sir. It shows yes. that is incomplete closure. Sir. Hmm. Uh, then, prominent anterior axillary fold was there. Okay. That shows the wasting of the pectoralis major muscle. Yes. Hmm. and there was polyhill sign uh, mm -hmm. with yes. the uh, with the prominence of uh, uh, apart from uh, before the polyhill would you like to say about the deltoid uh, yes, what about the proximal to distal proportion in the forearm its upper arm itself and then only the polyhill sir can you know yes ma'am uh, is the uh, deltoid symmetrically involved or asymmetrically involved asymmetrically involved deltoid ma'am yes so which deltoid is more in the, the lower uh, the lower portion of the deltoid uh, mm. there was not much wasting but upper portion there was much wasting yes selective involvement of deltoid only more than the other one deltoid is more affected than the other and deltoid is a uh, prominent the prominent deltoid deltoid sparing effect and gross asymmetry in the degree of deltoid sparing that is very well known then the upper part is bulky lower part is tapering that is also this, uh, part of this condition uh, you have shown about bilateral pier motor facial there is no cauda tympani there is no hyperacusis and except that heterochromia iridis which is bilateral and when you come to the upper limb it is a proximal weakness according to you does he have any uh, scapula ah uh, scapula is does he have any there was any Yes, ma'am. There was. Sir, can you just share that? Uh, uh, so different shades being due to um, serratus anterior and the uh, trapezius. Um, ma'am. Still producing. Hello. Hmm. Hello. Yes, I am. I am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I am not able to see. I am able to hear you. Can you just share your PPT? We are not able to see the PPT. Madam, are you able to see? No, 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 no. No PPT, sir. See. Can you just share again? I'm only hearing. I'll share one. No, doesn't matter. You can tell after that. You can share also. No issue. Now is it? Uh, Your first piece. Yeah, first one is. Is it visible? Very good, very good, excellent. So, what is this wingy? Describe this wingy. Um, it has a wingy no, with rotation. Yes, ma'am, with medial border. Yes, so the medial more border. More of the medial border. border. And the scapula is rotated. So, this is winging with rotation. Winging with rotation is typical feature of trapezius. Yes, without rotation is serratus anterior serratus anterior yes because serratus anterior is uniformly attached to the medial border of the scapula uniform displacement of the scapula above uh, away from the midline that is serratus anterior whereas winging with rotation is uh, trapezius second winging becomes more prominent during abduction that is what you are demonstrating that is also trapezius Trapezi and its deltoids are very typically very prominently standing that is also a, a unique feature and uh, you have got that poppy appearance it's called poppy sign yes ma'am 
Yes, that's also there. And you have got the scapular hump. You see the scapular hump here. Yes, ma'am. The scapular hump. So scapular hump is a feature of trapezius, and you find that there is a squaring. Even though the squaring is not very obvious, there is still a square and not a circle there. And scapular hump is there, and winging with rotation, winging on abduction. So that indicates it is trapezius, and. Um, yes, not serratus anterior, it is bilateral and the asymmetry is also very obvious. Uh, that is there and the poppy sign is there. So what is the special about polyhill sign? Um, it's the, uh, the deltoid is preserved. Huh? No, which sign. forms one hump. Yes. Then acromion, the next hump will be produced by the acromion process. Huh? Yes. This is the wasting of the upper part of the deltoid. Huh? Then uh, the next uh, hump will be produced by the high raising scapula mm. because of the trapezius weakness. Mm. So you have the brachioradial is also. You see, normally in most of the muscle diseases, brachioradial is clearly involved. Where yes, this is on unique condition where it can be asymmetrical, deltoid sparing, and brachioradial is sparing. So brachioradial is is usually severely involved or absent in most of the dystrophic muscle disease. Whereas yes, uh, in this condition, brachioradialysis will not be involved. So it will be spared and that leads to one of the polyphils. So, okay, then what else you want to say? Uh, then the patient was having exaggerated lardosis. Yes. What Why do you get exaggerated lardosis? Anterior abdominal muscle weakness. Yes. Hmm. So does he have that weakness? Did you check the yes, beaver sign? Um, beaver sign was positive in this patient. Okay. Um, on uh, lifting the sign? in this condition, where do you get beaver sign? In the lower abdominal muscle weakness. The umbilicus like the segmental weakness of the uh, rectus abdominis. Okay, then. Yes, hmm. On head to toe examination, and nevus was present. Yes. Uh, is, uh, I think it is uh, not uh, described as a feature, but Coates yes, disease, you can have Coates disease. Okay. Yes, Die. Then motor examination, ma'am. Mm. Uh, the bulk of the muscles, uh, um, here it shows uh, the arm muscles are weak compared to the forearm muscles, uh, mm. with uh, 21 centimeter of the arm and 26 centimeter forearm. Mm. Okay, that is. Uh, Loyalist yes, okay. Hmm. Then uh, uh, tone, shoulder and elbow, it was hypotonia, ma'am. Hmm. The, then rest all joints, it's normal tone. Hmm. And the power, neck flexion and extension, it is 4 by 5. Hmm. Uh, then the, this is the muscular, ma'am. Hmm. Power. Um, it's you don't uh, the proximal you muscles. Why you thought it is serratus anterior? You return winging of scapula due to serratus anterior. Uh, when, when I asked the patient no, to no, push the wall. Trapezius. Classical trapezius. Uh, serratus anterior. Yes, you, can proto, uh, you can push forward and see whether there is an additional involvement. Mixed involvement may be there, but what you demonstrated is not serratus anterior. Trapezius. Okay. This winging with rotation, winging more prominent with abduction, scapula or hump and squaring. All these are favoring a no, trapezius, but serratus can be involved, rhomboids can be involved. You try to demonstrate and say that there is a contribution from serratus as the winging also is demonstrated by forward pushing. And during that phenomena, the scapular dislocation is parallel to the spine. If you find anything like that, you can say that. Okay, then. In upper limb, which is the um, proximal muscles are weaker, the power being three by five, and the small muscles of the hand, the power remained five by five. Okay. Grading. And in the lower limb, abdominal muscles, beaver sign was positive. Eh? Then hip joint flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, external rotation and internal rotation is 5 by 5. Mm -hmm. And hamstrings and quadriceps also 5 by 5. Mm -hmm. TPL is anterior, that is dorsiflexion, it was 2 by 5. Eh? Mm -hmm. And it was not able to do dorsiflex. Eh? Plantar flexion, it was 5 by 5. Mm -hmm. The peroneal, the uh, aversion is lost. Eh? 3 mm -hmm. by 5. But then extensor digitorum longus and extensor halysis longus were also weak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
then uh, there was a hypertrophy of the extensor digitorum brevis bilaterally mm. uh then uh, coming to the facial muscles uh, the orbicular is oculi orbicular is oris risorius buccinator depressor anguli oris all are weak mm. bilateral mm. then superficial reflexes uh, its corneal conjunctival reflexes are intact uh, abdominal uh, reflexes and the uh, were lost and plantar uh, it was mute Mm. and coming to the deep renal reflexes uh, on bilateral its biceps and triceps jerk are absent mm. and supinator knee and ankle jerk it is two plus mm. coming to the gait of the patient uh, there was high stepping gait which is present on the bilateral side mm. uh, rest all examination it's normal ma'am so at the end of examination you have got a patient who is having a pure motor problem yes ma'am with the involvement of proximal upper limb distal yes. lower limb and bifacial yes. so if you yes. take away the odd feature which we found in the history that i will not take away i will still uh, look for clues and evaluate but if you remove the odd feature it is a, you have got several patterns you have got a proximal girdle pattern symmetrical that is typically seen in the dystrophic yes. muscle disease so yes. when, what do you call it as dystrophy dystrophy is a genetically determined progressive muscle disease you call it as a myopathy as a blanket statement any proximal progressive purely motor element syndrome can be called myopathy but if you know it is genetically determined you call it as dystrophy so most of this dystrophies have a proximal girdle pattern because they involve the bulky muscles is so got a distal involvement in distal myopathies so you have got a proximal symmetrical that is the classical dystrophic disease and you have got distal symmetrical that is distal myopathies and you have got the proximal upper limb and distal lower limb that you get it in uh, fshd and distal myopathy uh, distal uh, this uh, dysphalangeopathies where you have got uh, this kind of quadriceps pairing in the lower limb distal uh, that is uh, distal myopathy with rimmed vacuoles or dmrv it is called dmrv so you get a distal lower limb and proximal upper limb in fshd dmrv and you have got uh, scapuloperineal muscular dystrophy yes, scapuloperineal muscular dystrophy and you have got the proximal lower limb and distal upper limb in inclusion body myositis inclusion body myositis <laughs> so these are the various patterns so yes. let us forget the asymmetry if you take the asymmetry into account still anterior consul disease becomes a possibility because facial can be involved and asymmetry distal proximal everything can happen so first diagnosis forgetting the long asymmetry uh, but still the monstrous asymmetry proximal upper limb distal lower limb and facial involvement fshd or distal myopathy with rimmed vacuole their facial involvement does not happen but it will be proximal upper limb and distal lower limb so that way it is okay but facial involvement does not happen in dmrv so considering the facial involvement still anterior consul disease is a possibility uh, fibrillation fasciculations retained reflexes are all needed and even yes. em will not be useful to differentiate these two conditions biopsy will not be useful they at all will show mixed picture only so in fshd yes. and uh, anterior consul disease you can get fasciculations electrically you can have fibrillations and muscle biopsy may not show that much uh, classical myopathic pattern it will show mixed pattern muscle enzymes will not be grossly elevated so all this in the border zone so that becomes a second uh, differential diagnosis so if you are asked you should tell about the pattern first always ask can it be a acute condition acute condition you always ask for pain pain is that the connective element vasculature intramuscular nerves or fibrocollagenous tissue is also getting involved which is happening in metabolic endocrine and inflammatory muscle disease so presence of pain second yes, presence of fatigability fatigability is activation and retained reflex other system involvement so pain fatigability fluctuation retained reflex and other system involvement now always ask for even if it is the oddest case because that gives you some clue about a treatable element so if it is not there you analyze the pattern and now you know the pattern facial with proximal upper limb and distal lower limb 
and asymmetry whether this gross asymmetry is true or not we don't know if it is yes, not really true it can fit into a muscle disease if it yes, is uh, uh, and other possibility and a muscle disease where years of asymmetry is well known so whereas in fsh it is some uh, few months usually but it can be that patient never knew so and uh, uh, it is a phenotypic diagnosis you can look for coat disease in the fundus uh, yes ma'am uh, you don't have to do genetics you don't have to do uh, muscle biopsy because phenotype is diagnostic so yes, I, i also feel that it may be fshd only but uh, yes, we are discussing like this so that we don't miss that one odd case so how are yes, you going to help this person um uh, as the facial scapular humeral dystrophy do not have any treatment or curative ma'am but we can uh, give the assistant to the patient in the form of form of foot arthrosis yes you mm-hmm. can do external appliances uh, yes, to improve his quality of life and uh, tell all these muscle patients not to put on weight if they take yes, on vegetarian i use all uh, possible opportunities to promote vegetarianism so uh, yes. even they put on Uh, weight they will think he is weak so we will feed him with all fatty materials and the what puts on the weight is not muscle it is fat and uh, so he will not be able to carry his body and they become easily disabled so avoid weight gain and yes, exercise ma'am. the muscles which are available to retain their bulk to work hypertrophy when you exercise there is something called work hypertrophy so the bulk okay. will be retained for some more time prevent contractures fractures falls and external external arthrosis to promote ambulation so this much yes, only uh, enzymes what did you do is it normal or increased uh, creatinine kinase is normal no uh, that's what because i as i told fshd sits on like a cart on the wall between and consular muscle disease enzymes may not be elevated emg we can show fasciculations muscle biopsy will show mixed picture so none of these things are there needed and if this phenotype is fitting examine the father or mother or any family member for because varying phenotype is there very mild to very severe very asymmetrical okay. to symmetrical all these patterns are known so examine most of the family members and see for subtle features if that yes, is ma'am. vertebral artery aneurysm and foramen magnum tumors you don't need not think because they never okay. run in families no so you will examine family members that is very mandatory no okay. need to do genetic no need to do muscle biopsy yes, and if the phenotype is confirmatory and any family member shows the dominant trait then the diagnosis is over okay yes, anything else uh, ma'am i have a doubt ma'am yes. uh, if we consider anterior onset this is as a diag- uh, like a differential diagnosis uh, mm-hmm. if we take the age of the onset of the disease it is mm-hmm. almost at the 15 years of mm-hmm. age uh, when the patient like uh, can we think of anterior onset disease yes uh, you have got so many uh, early onset anterior onset disease in fact okay. classification of anterior onset disease is based on age also you have got the uh, smas they are very early onset no okay. and you have got sod mutation superoxide dismutase mutations they are early onset anterior onset disease only the als and uh, als type of anterior onset disease pseudo bulbar palsy bulbar palsy they are late onset whereas okay. primary lateral sclerosis sod mutations they are all young onset and the sms are all anterior onset disease which can start at birth and intra uterine also so yes you can have anterior onset disease at any age fasciculations uh, it is more uh, sub, uh, objective than subjective so patient may not complain you look for it if you find it is very good but if you do not find it doesn't exclude look for electrical fasciculation uh, but in uh, crossover diseases like in this con- kind of conditions you will find fasciculation even if it is fsshd <coughs> it's not going to help you muscle and sense will be elevated it's not going to help you so it is uh, muscle and sense will not be elevated so these things will not be useful but what you have is the polyhill pattern hypertrophy of the muscles you see yes, anterior is generally hypertrophy is not there except rarely it can happen but uh, it is generally not there pseudo hypertrophy is a feature of muscle disease 
So you have got so much of standing out of deltoid, uh, brachioradiolis, all these switches you have to take and uh, and so such a long time and the disability is relatively, it is there. But by 10 years, an antimonsal disease will be more disabled than a, a muscle disease. And uh, yes, of course, uh, tremors, uh, favoring antimonsal disease, retained reflex, where you have found many of the reflexes are embedded. And you can look at the heart, the heart involvement is there in muscle disease, not in antimonsal disease, like that various points. But FSHD is a unique disease, which is a crossover science. So none of these data mm -hmm. will be useful other than examining a family member. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you did very well. Nice presentation and uh, um, Thank you. answered all the questions very good. I just told about the arm muscles, fan muscles, because you should not be taken by surprise when a question is asked in the exam about yes, the protractor, retractor, adductor, abductor, hmm? small muscles. Yes, so 